You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. On today's show, we sit down with Nick Hughes. In addition to creating the Global Entrepreneur Network Founders Live in Seattle, Washington, 2016, Nick stays busy as an advisor to numerous startups and occasionally takes positions in sales and biz dev roles if needed. Previously, he founded the mobile payment startup Seconds, as well as helping start CoinMe, a company built around expanding Bitcoin and digital transactions into the physical realm via Bitcoin ATMs. As a sought-after advisor, entrepreneur, speaker, writer, and guest appearance on many technology and media outlets, Nick enjoys helping others discover their unique entrepreneur path. On today's show, we talk about why does Founder Live do 99-second pitches? Will accelerators still have a place post-COVID? What are the different needs of startups based on their geographic location? And where are the gaps existing in these startup community infrastructures? This and much more today's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Now let's begin. Enjoy. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. All right, Nick. I mean, we've known each other now, I'd say a couple of years now. I mean, we've been introduced. I, I've been a guest uh, at one of your events. I've been on your podcast. It's definitely time now for you to be on my podcast. This has been, you know, in the making for a long time. But, you know, I know you really well. But for our audience out there that may not be too familiar with your organization, which they should be, especially if they're in the startup ecosystem, can you give us a little bit of background of what you're working on, your career up until this point? Sean, thank you so much. Uh, just it's a pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, you know, uh, you know, Founders Live is a global startup marketplace and community that really connects people to the network, the resources, information, and opportunities to be successful and, and grow around the world. And in short answer, I can give you the short answer, and then we can dive into the back story if you really want to hear it. But um, the short answer is really we have a global platform to really provide exposure, connectivity to people around the world. And Founders Live is both a pitch competition originated out of Seattle, Washington, where I was from, or you know, kind of still is, but I travel around the world. And then you know, we just started expanding to new cities and building out our global community and platform. So what started in one city now has reached uh, more than 70 cities, uh, 25 countries around the world. And starting to really build out our uh, ecosystem. And really, it's almost a, a, an economy that's forming through the Founders Live ecosystem that reaches you know, all over the world. So I can give more background on that, but um, that's the short answer. A lot of pitch events. I mean, there's pitch events all over the world, but they're always one city. They're one person organize it, you know, maybe monthly, maybe once a quarter. I don't think there is any out there that is this global dominant. Can, can you talk about how you took it from Seattle and grew it? Yeah. So this is a very intriguing question and answer set in the sense that, um, you know, I've been asked this a number of times and I, and I think the, 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 the part of the answer is around, well, what makes things attractive to others so that they want to do it too? What is it, right? Because you're right. There are other pitch events and competitions, and a lot of them kind of are the one city thing, or it's organized in that city. And I'll tell you one thing: I never will forget when I brought on one of my coaches. His name's Dale. So, Dale, thank you so much. Dale, in a number of ways, really helped me formulate what I really wanted to do and what really was this thing, which turned into Founders Live. And he asked me some significant questions, uh, which are like, hey, what's important to you? What's important to the organization and company that resulted in turning out to be our core values? In short, our core values are respectful authenticity, gather around the campfire, open the door, and no name tags. But in reality, it's just kind of business equals fun. You can go into depth on all of those. But the point is this, is that with respectful authenticity, it's actually turned into what we're calling entrepreneurial quality. And 
with deep within founders live is this like movement around opening opportunities and opening doors for people to really be discovered to really get their exposure and 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 take that next step uh, to get their company and their their project and their 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 startup out in the open and growing and when you put that into a formula like basically a playbook so from seattle i then created this like playbook Portland was the next city that we launched in 2017 was literally city number two. And I just like kind of, I, you know, from Portland to, I think it was Denver, um, Chicago and a couple others. We just took those first five and just tested it out and it started to work. And, and I created, uh, back in the day, like I created this like format, this cycle, there is a cycle to running this thing. I took what I learned for two years, like running it in Seattle and packaged it up and said, Hey, we're, we're looking for city leaders. So I put out notices and through social media and others and led with our core values. That's the key. I led with the core values. So people are like, Oh, this is an interesting company and I want to be a part of it. So it called out to the people and it's not like we said, "Hey, we're look, we're hiring, and we're we're going to pay people." These are like on ambassador and volunteer positions. So by calling out and like kind of putting it out in the ether and and actually attracting the right people, we were able to hit those first five to ten, and then from five to ten, the brand starts taking over, and that takes you from like ten to like seventy. You know that that we're at now, and I can answer many many different questions on that, but I I would just say that. Any company out there, whether you're like Founders Live or not, it's probably a smart idea to create what your values are, what you stand for, because then that starts calling out and attracting the right people to your organization that will start to allow it to grow. So with that, now that you know 70 cities, 25 countries, you've gotten to see the startup ecosystem in all these locations, all these places. With the current infrastructure for the startup communities around the world, or if you want to just focus on the US, uh, great. Where are you seeing all the gaps? I guess I'd answer it this way is there, it's slightly the same story that was happening a couple of years ago that like there just is this, there's a really cool movement outside of, and I know this is called Silicon Valley podcast, but like, you know, outside of San Francisco or Silicon Valley and New York and Seattle and you know the the general places that we were familiar with and for instance like I'm going to be in Nashville next month we're launching in Nashville and you talk to the people there and they're like no this is like it's happening there's really a lot of growth and I the pandemic just expanded and accelerated the growth in these second to third tier cities and that's what we talk about too with Founders Live is yeah we have Founders Live New York and even Founders Live San Francisco but we're one of many events and thousands of things happening in those cities. But when you look at when we launch in Nashville, Founders Live Nashville is going to be a significant thing. And, and especially because that city, just the dynamics of music and entertainment, we usually, we, yeah, we mesh those together really well. But when you look at, you know, obviously Austin, when you look at Denver and Boulder, I just think over time, and I actually just had a call earlier today with someone in, in, in Indianapolis. There's just a lot of great energy there. And it looks like we might even launch there at some point here in the summer. So I think it's those mid-tier cities that are going to continue to see really interesting growth over the next three to five years. And we're really excited about that. Yeah, I mean, here, I can't even tell you the number of people that I've known in the last year that have moved from Silicon Valley to these cities, whether it's North Carolina, whether it's... I I mean, I, I was just on a call the other day, two buddies... You know, one went to Florida, one's in Medellin, Colombia now. They're just going everywhere. So with this talent leaving Silicon Valley and going to these cities, are you seeing maybe even quicker adoption or more resources for the startup communities in these areas? Yes, but let's take the train of thought, which is when it was more isolated in Silicon Valley in New York or some of the in Seattle. When it's concentrated, it's easier for these resources to be able to make impact or they're easier discovered and all that. When you see the distribution or expansion to all these parts of the world, 
there's a trailing effect that, or a lagging effect that is just going to take some time. And what we're also noticing, I will say that there's a trend that's happening within Founders Live recently that I'm hearing more from our teams. Localization is really important. And what that means is when you're someone in Jakarta or Manado, Indonesia, which we're, we're in like 10 plus cities, like we're totally expanding and, and, and really blowing up over there. Indonesia, it's all great. They look at something like Founders Live and they're like, hey, this is really cool, but they can tell it's from the United States. And they're desiring a localized version. It's the equivalent of you're in you're in California there and something out of Indonesia comes to you and you're like, wow, this is pretty cool. But wouldn't you wish that it was in English? <laughs> and, and like, wouldn't you wish that the people could maybe look a little more like you? And so that's the double-edged sword of international and the things that we're doing. But just seeing like when, you know, Colombia, you know, we're in uh, Bogota and we're looking at Medin, but like when we, when you're in Colombia, they're literally like, what about the Spanish version of, and they do, when they do Founders Live events, they are in Spanish and it's all good. But so I think when you look at the expansion of the resources, localization is something that you have to do at some point. We're kind of struggling with that, but we're looking at how to do that appropriately. If you're a SaaS platform, if you are company that bring a resource or brings a service to startups globally, you might want to think about that, which is how do you, if you want to and desire to serve international companies, how do you do that appropriately and efficiently? That's like not easy. So let's go back to Founders Live over this last year. I mean, prior 2017 started a lot of in-person events, but then this last year, so many things were shut down. How did these startups events change or adapt over this last year? Yeah, we shifted very quickly to virtual, as did a lot of other people. We were able to find a format that really worked well for us and for Founders Live. And we stream our events. They basically look like a, it looks like a show. It works out really well. Typically, they're experienced on YouTube or, or Facebook. We use like a kind of digital studio system where then in the end, you're seeing it on YouTube and there's comments on the screen and there's colors and branding and really great. You know, it turned out really well, but we did have to shift. And, and I think that the unfortunate reality, which we all experienced was like that lack of like human networking, right? The human connection. And so I think that although the quality of our shows seemed to improve actually because of the, through the pandemic, the virtual nature, like the quality of just like you're able to, you know, because we were attempting live streaming before the pandemic, it just wasn't working in the right way. And so the live stream system works well. It's like a show, it looks like a TV show. Like there's days where, like, when I'm, I mean, honestly, every single week there's like a founder's live somewhere, right? So it's kind of cool to be like this week, there's uh, Gdansk Poland as their first event. So we're launching in Poland. And then there's Guadalajara, Mexico, and then there's San Diego this week. And so it's, it's like, it's kind of like turning on ESPN. It's like, I'm going to check out, put it on like literally the big screen. It's pretty cool to like sit there and see like your connected TV and you can watch Founders Live. So that's the big change was that we were able to really shift into the digital experience. But I think that as the world starts to open back up, we're we're now like in this awkward phase again, right? Like, didn't we all just like flip in, like we did this like total flip into digital and live stream stuff last year in like March, April of 20, 2020. We kind of got used to the world and now we're flipping into this, like everything's going to go back. And so the question is, what does that go back to? And it's going to be a hybrid and we're already working on that and really excited to really pull together and, and release like what those hybrid experiences will look like. Which basically means there would be two or three hundred people in a physical event location, and maybe there's five hundred to a thousand people watching virtual, and that both experiences are at the highest quality possible. That's what we'll be doing as we go into this like next phase. I got a few questions about the startups in general. Have you seen what they've asked for over the last year or so? Kind of change with with the lockdown. Are they asking for more funding, more introductions, more? 
what type of conversations are you having with these early stage companies? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if the funding, funding is always the <laughs> first ask, you know, and I would simply say that there just is, I mean, it's exposure. It's with the lockdown. Let's, let's remember that. And I know that we're in the United States, if you're listening to this in the US, we're maybe we're looking at coming out of it. And depending on what state you're in will depend on how accelerated that is. But I think there has been less opportunity for connection exposure. And we're all like, still at our places. And, you know, it's just if you can't line up that zoom call, whatever that is, if you can't line that up, how do you get exposure? How do you get the meeting with the investor? How do you get even the first step? And so I think that that's the result of one of one of the results from the pandemic was just actually a less opportunities, which that's what Founders Live is the goal is to improve on. I think just like meetings, exposure, obviously access to investors and capital, those are all like high level. And whether it's a pandemic or not, they're needing them. And what about introductions? A lot of people go to maybe accelerator programs. There's a lot of famous ones, Y Combinator, Techstars, Alchemist, to get introductions for their company as they go through the process. But over the last year, there's a lot that were locked down. Many went virtual. What are your thoughts of the future of accelerator programs? Is there going to be still a huge place for them? And the companies that aren't in the programs, do you see opportunities for them moving forward? Yeah. This is a great thought process. I've been evaluating and studying the accelerator concept for a number of years. And I mean, my honest answer is, look, it's kind of two things. Number one, from the operator side, literally operating an accelerator, the economics are tough because typically the model is really around... And this is kind of as Techstars and Y Combinator really formulated this model 10, 15 years ago, we'll create a thing, we'll upfront invest a small amount, we'll accelerate you for three to four months, and then we'll like push you on your way. And hopefully there's demo day so that you can like raise money and our investment increases in value. But the problem with that is it takes 10 to 15 years for an exit to happen. If that's the only model, you're literally, I mean, it's just a venture, it's a venture firm with this front of a bit of education and mentorship and pushing them out the door. Like it literally takes 10 to 15 years to see those returns. Only few can actually do that if you think about it. So in the proliferation of all these accelerators, like there's been some tweaks on the model. Essentially, there has to be some sort of cash flow revenue generation. Literally, how is that accelerator as a business going to operate, have a staff do the thing that they need to do bring in the startups, accelerate them and still take equity ownership. Like where's the money come from? So I think on the operator side, the experiment has proven that I don't think that there's a great recurring sustainable model that is like a home run. Oh, that as a business, as an accelerator business, can like grow big time and be very successful because I just think it takes a chunk of money as the investment and then ride out that investment for 10 or 15 years to then see your return. So I don't see a lot of out there that are actually models that we... Because we've evaluated this for like 5 years almost. On the startup side, you just want to evaluate what accelerator is it? What's the dynamics? What's the history? Have they like accelerated other companies before? And what's the result? And if you're going to get money, then that's fine. And that's great. There's some investment there. I think a good question is... Is it a net positive? I don't think it's a net negative, but is it literally a net positive for you as the founding team to go into an accelerator? And there's no way to know because you literally, if you choose to go in there, then great. We've, we've accelerated and we raised a little money and we got going, but you also gave up some of that equity. And so I'm kind of neutral on all these things, but I do look at if there is a way to accelerate and grow a cohort of early stage companies and also have an equity stake in a group of those companies and have it economically viable, Founders Live will be interested in that. Okay. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but I got to follow up. And if you want to defer the question, I got a next one lined up. If Founders Live were to do an accelerator, what do you think kind of 
that structure would be time frame? Would it be all virtual? Would it be in person? Would it be three weeks, six months? Putting you on the spot. So if, if you want to pass, go for it. But I'm just kind of curious. Well, it would be definitely virtual. The thing with Founders Live is uh, we are tremendously, tremendously international. What we want to do is we want to serve startups, whether they're out of Ferrari, Zimbabwe, or they're out of Houston or San Francisco. And secondly, I just don't know the time frame. I think anything shorter than a month is just too much. Or, I mean, it's just like too quick. I think anything more than six months is a long time in startup life. The three month, four month might be a good chunk. How we want to structure that is still really still being evaluated. But again, I'll just go back to like, we flip flop from because there's models out there where it's like, hey, this is like three grand for three months. So literally startups, the companies are paying and they do get accelerated. But then there's a possibility of investment. So really what that is, is a business for the accelerator. And on the other side, there's literally the like, what are you going to give us as startups? Like, what's our investment? We're only giving 5 to 7% of our company. And we want to make sure that we have a round of a seed round, if not leading into the A. If you operate that way, well, you better have a fund that is actually running that. So I don't know if there's a middle ground. I really don't. Because like in the end, it's got to be quality. I mean, that the whole Y Combinator brand was because they grew early on with these like Airbnb was one of the first or one of the first startups to come out and build that Y Combinator brand. So I, I, I'm kind of floating on this answer, but that's where I'm at right now is, of course, we would look to do something like this, but the model has to work. And the thing is, the model has to work for Zimbabwe companies in US. And maybe those are like, maybe it's a slightly different segment of the world and actually separate accelerator. But that's how I think. Like I think about and I care about people in Indonesia. I care about people in, in Zimbabwe. And we want to help them and we want to accelerate them or however we want to do that. Like maybe the models are going to be different in each region of the world. So we're just puzzle pieces trying to p- figure it out. I mean, it sounds like every time you're thinking about anything, it's a global view, uh, this macro view of everything. With that, I mean, you've met startup founders all over the world. What are the differences in maybe mindset or the way you know they look at a startup from Portland, Seattle to you know Nairobi, Prague, the people you've had conversations with, how's it different? One aspect is, and this is just obviously you're you're hearing this, and if you're as you're listening to this, you're hearing like I definitely have a global view. That's just the way it is. But a lot of times when I meet these entrepreneurs, look, they have local problems. They have so, for instance, like in Zimbabwe, I met all these founders and they're building great things. And, and typically they're serving the African population, if not like Zimbabwe population. They need Zimbabwe resources. They need Zimbabwe answers. At this point, you know, Founders Live doesn't necessarily provide that well because we're a global thing and we're not as localized. Um, so that's one thing that I think is something that probably the next five to 10 years of Founders Live will really build out these like local nodes that will serve in much more of a localized manner in a localized level. You know, I was in Argentina, I was in um, London in the UK. And, you know, it's like, when I meet the entrepreneurs, it's amazing. I want to talk about the similarities next, but differences are like, essentially, it's perspective and, and it's like needs. And when they, as you know, as a founder and a founding team, you're really focused on the next 30 to 60 to 90 days. And it's like, do we have enough cash to go 90 days? Do we we have these needs for our, our customers or our users? And so they're very hyper-focused on hyper-local things. When I travel to Zimbabwe, it's like, it's sometimes you kind of feel like you don't, you don't really know what to say and you don't know how to help them when you're not local. But a lot of it is needs and capital. It just depends on the level of capital. But capital is 100% a need or most most of the time, a very desired need. Okay, now you got to go to the similarities. No, the similarities are great, you know, and a story I was, when I was in Zimbabwe, man, it was, 
it was very touching and it was amazing because this was in this was uh, mid, later of 2019, actually November, and I was on this world tour that we can talk about as well. But to be in a land in a place like Harare, Zimbabwe. And to go to Founders Live because it was in person and to look around and I'm like the only one that looks like me. And there's 100 plus people there and they're doing Founders Live, right? And it was like, like I almost broke down. It was so touching. It was awesome. And it was just really cool to see that I'm on the other side of the world. And typically, generally, when you look at this population, you just don't think that they're similar to Silicon Valley, but they are. And they're entrepreneurs as well. And they all want a better future. And they're all creating like unique and, and cool things. And they see the world similar as entrepreneurs. We found, yo, here's a there's a problem. We want to solve it with this solution, blah, blah, blah. I then sat down with this guy because they like basically lined up some people that I could, you know, that, that essentially like here's my calendar. Let's book some mentor meeting sessions or whatever. And this guy sits down and he's, he's literally like, he starts quoting the core values. And he's like, man, these are so cool. Like these really have changed my life the way I like view things. And I love Founders Live. And I was just like, what? You know, like just having someone re- say like, dude, this core value. And he like reads it out. And he's like, that really impacted me. And it's changed me. And then he just looks at me and he's like, look, we're the same as you. You're the same as me. We're just trying to move forward. And we just need the resources and opportunities that... And he was looking at me like, I mean, I'm going to be facetious here, but like Jeff Bezos almost. And I'm I'm like, man, I'm not there. But more importantly, he was simply wanting the American way of thinking that we have it all. And I'm just like, no, man, like we're fighting for this road too. And I don't know what his world is like, really, day to day, year to year. But what I can tell you is it was like two people sitting there, two founders that whether they knew it or not, was very, very, very similar and striving for similar things, maybe at slightly different scales. But it just was like one of those kinship things. You know, I gave him a hug at the end and I was like, man, you know, it's like so good to meet you. And I just tried to share my thoughts and help him and mentor him. But in reality, we're all looking for the same thing and we all have the same fears and we all have the same. We have ambition, but we're held back by our mental, stupid, you know, the things in our mental capacity that are telling us no. And I don't know. It was just a really human experience. So speaking of that, in these countries, they need localized resources, you mentioned. Are they getting it from government, from nonprofits, from outside funding sources? Where does it look like right now there's some kind of help to give them the resources that they might be looking for? Each country is different. Actually, what's surprising to me is certain countries' government is much more involved for early stage innovation and startups. Kind of crazy, especially from the US. Our government is not necessarily that active and involved in early stage startups and helpful. And, you know, yeah, you can go look at SBA and some of those loans or whatever. But in reality, that's where private in venture capital, angel investment comes in and just like that aspect. And so some countries are surprising to me much more advanced in the structure of their government helping in grants and other things of that nature, helping early stage companies and activities get off the ground. So that's number one. It's always surprising to me when governments are actually that involved. Depending on the country and the region, you know, there could be an early stage investment community, but definitely nothing compared to what Silicon Valley is or the United States. But de- definitely different regions have different advancements in what their early stage funding and investment community is. It is lacking the like infrastructure of like the partnerships, the so why Founders Live is so important. We're coming in and we're starting to like able to pull in some of those partners and resources, the banks, the law firms, the marketing firms, all these things that are the structurally important. Founders Live is not the only one, but there's things like Startup Grind and others that are become the connective tissue to introduce that like 
oh, it's a new law firm that we focus on early stage companies. And now there's like an event like Founders Live that all these early stage companies are around. So now it's starting to make that dynamic ecosystem stronger. So I, I would say a lot of these cities are still quite a bit far behind in, the, in that way. It sounds like the network and the experience is still growing and still developing in a lot of these places. Was there one that you went to that totally shocked you how much further along they were than you expected? I'll answer that in a kind of a unique way. I was pleasantly surprised in Argentina. If you do any research in Argentina, they've, they've had some struggles over the last you know five to 10 years of like inflation and just kind of been like up and down. And, and yet there's a lot of creativity there, man. There's a lot of creativity and a lot of entrepreneurial activity. And I really enjoyed it. We actually had three cities. So when I was there in December of 2019, I actually went from Buenos Aires. I went to Cordoba. And Cordoba, by the way, is just... Cordoba is like the city in Argentina that just has all the universities. And so there's like a ton of young, kind of younger adults and college stage and a lot of beautiful women, a lot of beautiful men, and actually a lot of uh, creative activity. And so Cordoba was great and really enjoyed that. And then I went to Bariloche. And Bariloche was... The only way I can describe it is it's like in the Patagonia area. I mean, literally, it's Patagonia is uh, really the area between Argentina and Chile. And it's literally a mountain range. And there's all these like cool like lakes. And it's just a big area. And it, this area looks like Tahoe. So it reminded me of Lake Tahoe. And Bariloche, like in the wintertime, is like a ski destination. And then in the summertime, so I was there in December, but that's the summertime. It was like, there was no snow and it's a resort town, like on this beautiful lake and just so cool. And it looks like, it looks like Lake Tahoe, like just how Tahoe is like surrounded by like all these ski resorts and then like a couple cities. And we had a founder's live there. And yeah, I'm going to tell you another story real quick too. This is so cool. Just by like, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm like, Man, I've been in three different Argentine cities and I'm looking at these people and they're pitching a concept. Like they're literally pitching an entrepreneur, like they're entrepreneurs. They weren't advanced in some sense. Bariloche is like a, it's like, imagine that town that's sitting on uh, Lake Tahoe. So it's less advanced than like Buenos Aires, that is a world class city. But I was pleasantly impressed. With the activity now, let's note that all of these, <laughs> all of these were in Spanish, and I did not know what they were saying. Like I don't speak Spanish, dude. So I'm like, I'm literally at these events, and I needed a translator, and just for me to say something and them to translate it to Spanish, and I literally was like, they're they could be making fun of me, and I don't even know. They're probably like, who's look at this like gringo guy, like you know who's this guy? But they really did enjoy me, and I'm the CEO there, and it was fun, but. All in Spanish, which is uh, shocking, but which was really cool to see that it was obviously in another language. Got one more story, but I kind of want to pause there if you have any thoughts on that. No, I want to hear stories. Keep going, man. <laughs> I'm in like literally South America in Patagonia area, Bariloche in Argentina. And I'm at this event. And I mean, there was like 50 people there. It was kind of in the smaller area, but it's like one of those. Again, it's like this kind of like resort town overlooking the water. It was really picturesque. And we're doing the Founders Live event and they had this keg, like they brought in a keg of beer. And I'm like, oh, sweet. You know, and so, you know, Argentina beer, you know, they they make good beer and there's all this. And so there was these women that they had brought in that actually this was their, they had brewed this beer. So this was like their company. And I'm like talking with them a little bit. And simply making small talk, I'm like, yeah, hey, you know, this is yours. And like, yeah. And I was asking, like, what, how are they brewing it or where are they brewing it? And she just is like, yeah, we're like outside of the city a little bit. And she's like, I said something about the hops or whatever. And she's like, yeah, we get our hops from the US. And, um, and she's like, yeah, Yakima, Washington. And I looked at her and I'm like, that's where I grew up. Like, Yakima, Washington. Where I grew up in the state of Washington, 
up in the Pacific Northwest is literally like the hops capital of the world. The amount of hops that are grown in that area, because like that area of Washington is very agricultural and the weather just really is perfect for hops that go into beer. And they export all over the world. And this, I'm in Argentina at this random, it's Founders Live event. And she literally throws out the city, Yakima, Washington. And it, I'm, I look at her, I'm like, that's where I was, that's where I grew up. That's where I'm from. And she just like, was like, what? And so it was pretty cool to experience, you know, drinking beer that was birthed out of my hometown. That's just, you know, that just proves how more and more connected we are every day. So, so some advice for startups that want to present at one of your events globally around the world, what advice do you have for them in their presentations? This is always a great question. And, you know, I would sum it up in probably three or four points. Number one, if you're going to pitch, like what we look for is an established company, you are in market, people can find and use your product. So basically, you're either in between your bootstrapped or up to a Series A, you know, usually what we call $5 million financing. If you meet those requirements, I would just say you've got to figure out your story. And the thing with the 99 second pitch is it's not regurgitation of all these data and like acronyms and industry speak. The Founders Live pitch is much more consumer oriented. So we provide opportunities for pitch prep and coaching. But what's that story? What's the story? Like, in the end, why should people even care? Like, that's the whole point, right? So you as a founder, crafting your story and making that pitch cohesive, but very engaging within a minute 30 or a minute 39. That's number one. Number two, I just have to stop you right there. Yeah. 99 seconds. Everyone else's is, you know, seven minutes, 15 minutes. How'd you even come up with 99 seconds? Because <laughs> you're on the hot seat that whole time. Well, the short answer is why the hell not? But the, the, the longer answer is, I guess I've always loved the, the number 99 in a sense, like that's the year I graduated high school. So now I was class of 99. And I started looking at, yeah, there's like the two minute pitch, the nine, 90 seconds. And I was like, no. And, and by the way, here's the serious answer is that when you create a company or a brand, it's important to have brandable and branded type of thing. 99 seconds, the 99 second pitch is our brand. And it's very unique. It's not 90 seconds because that's just a minute. That's a minute and a half. And no one really cares about that. But when you say 99, people are like, wait, 99, that's interesting. And so it just became a, a why the hell not? And let's do 99 seconds. And that's really unique. And that can be memorable. That, that's really the reasons why I chose that. All right, now now go on. I, I cut you off right. while you're giving yeah. advice. Continue. It's good. It's good. I, I think the second one is for sure, like, you know, obviously when you practice and you prepare, I mean, you got to put preparation into your pitch. When you create your slide deck, you know, less is more. Do you have visuals? Do you have a well designed looking slide deck that is a nice companion to your vocal pitch? If you're putting bullet points on a slide deck, this is not a good thing. And, you know, I'm not going to be judging you too much here. But when you look at well-designed pitch decks that are for a vocal pitch, I'm not talking about this like chunky, big, strong investor pitch deck. Sure, have bullet points, have supporting data. But when you're walking through like a 99 second pitch, and especially like live in front of people, whether it's virtual or like a, an in-person event, then your illustrative aspect of your deck needs to be supportive to the message. Because when, just so you know, when people are watching and when you're pitching to them in the audience, they're doing this. They're like, they're trying to read your slides and then they're like trying to watch you and, and listen to what you're saying. But then they're like, so don't do that to them. Like literally have something that is so supportive that they can engage on what you're saying and they can look in your eyes and they're like, oh, this person passionate. This person knows what they're talking about. But if they're sitting there reading sentences and bullet points on your slides, you're losing them, right? So that's probably the second thing. The third one is uh, really around through that story and through that arc, you know, really you're thinking about the one thing that you want them to leave with or remember you by. 
So like, what is that like one thing where you're like, if you have a great pitch, you've got them saying like, God, that's like, I can't stop thinking about that sweet. Like it was just a great pitch. And it sounds like that's something I want to use. So you have them locked in on like this, like one strong, like sentence. And usually that's like the problem. Like you, you're just, you're talking about the problem and then you're leaving them with like, I've got that problem too. I want to use that as a solution. And so usually that's the goal of your, especially your founders live, like 99 second pitches. You're leaving them with like, Oh, that's awesome. I want more. I want more information. Uh, I, you know, maybe they're an investor saying like that person has got it. I love the problem solution set. How do I get more information or maybe follow up for an investment? Those are three things. I mean, there, there, there's definitely more. I, I would say lastly, like, look, we're, we're not going away from virtual. This is uh, using your, your laptop and your, using your pitching on Zoom or with Founders Live, you're using some sort of virtual system. Don't just read. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think having a, what we would call stage presence, but now screen presence, whichever venue you're in, is like so, so important. Like what is your stage and screen presence? Are you confident? Are you practiced? Are you knowing your pitch and your message so well that you can just flow through it? Or are you literally like reading the slides? Because that comes across as, ah, I just, that person's not convincing me that they're in it. And that, that the person doesn't convince me that they're like, no, they're, they don't know their stuff if they're reading the slides. You know what I mean? So how well rehearsed do you think they should be before going up doing a 99 second pitch? I mean, I'm sure there's been times at your events where some guys had a few drinks, goes up there and tries to wing it. But, uh, but I'm guessing there's others that suit and tie well rehearsed. Like what's, what's the right amount? Obviously it's going to depend on the person, but I think it's, I think it's rehearsed enough where they are when, when you're just like what I was saying, which is like, when you're casual, you're confident, you, you know, your message. I mean, my advice on that is, I don't memorize speeches and talks when I give them. I know the high level. Okay. Like these are the things I want to touch on. And especially like these are the three main bullet points, like the three points that I want to hit. And yes, you should be prepared. You should have practiced. You should clearly it's just like training. Like you've ran the circles, you've ran the lines, you know, you know, the training you're working, you know, you're strengthening yourself in that way. So I think practice being prepared, but don't be robotic. That comes across weird too. So it depends on the person, but be prepared enough that you're comfortable and confident. I think that's part of the key is confidence because then they're like, oh, okay, like I'm feeling this person and and they're confident in their message. So I'm confident in hearing it. But if they're not confident in their message on stage or on the screen, uh, I'm not going to be confident either. So it just depends on the person. But I think it's just getting to that like confidence point. And then with that, I got to ask, what's the future like for Founders Live? What are some new things you're going to work on, some initiatives? What's the next year, two years look like? So excited about this. One of the things that we kicked in motion, oh, this is is awesome. Because of virtual and the pandemic, we were able to put in motion something that we had been wanting to do for a while. Really, it's around more of a global competition and, and aspect. And so... Because things are virtual, we're now able to have what's called Founders Live Primetime. And Founders Live Primetime is our global competition that all the winners from the city level events, they actually advance and they go into a qualification. And the way it works is we're looking for the top 25 startups every year globally from around Founders Live that is broken up into regions of the world. So we have five regions, North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. So you can, you know, as I talk about this, you can kind of start to piece together where the next, where's the next five to 10 years going to go. And what we're doing is we're looking for five in each region. So all the winners every quarter advance into the qualification. And it's really, it's like, it's primetime.founderslive. And that really is just a area where all the pit, the, the, the videos of the winners go into this area where people can watch their pitches and really essentially like the video or vote. And that click of the button is the voting. And now we stack rank those startups in the regions and we pull off like the top one or two that then 
Q4 is prime time season, literally like the prime time season. And so there's a prime time event for North America. There's a prime time event for South or Latin America, Europe, Asia, Africa. And through that Founders Live event for that prime time event, again, it's a fun, it's a celebration, it's a competition. And then the winners of that go on to Founders Live Fest at the end of the year, like our final event of the year. And, and so all that happens basically October, November, and then into, into December. And so you can now see that the whole structures in place for like the city level events that, that funnel up into qualification, that funnel up into the, the regional events around the world, and then that funnel to like the final event for Founders Live. And there's so much to build on that, right? Like we've now broken it up into five regions. What can you do as like a really awesome Founders Live event for Latin America? I mean, shouldn't there be like a half a million to a million people like engaged in this like awesome celebration? I mean, that could and should be a really, really cool future. Starting to put that on like network TV, maybe, or like, or at least streaming it in a way that reaches a half a million to a million people that we're highlighting entertainers and new creative entrepreneurs. And then, oh, by the way, here's the top five of your region from 2021. And it's a huge... And what does this all do? Exposure to the startup and exposure to that founding team. And hopefully there will be investors watching it. So that's like one thing, you know, and, and just curious your thoughts on that as I paint it, because going back to your comment before, this is why like as Founders Live grows larger, we, the, you know, there is not a lot out there that shows this competition on a hyper local level, but then the, like this global thing that. I think we were at least in the right direction on that. No, I love the vision. I mean, I just, the whole idea of helping entrepreneurs around the world and create a global community where everyone helps each other, benefits from, from the connection, from the group. It, you know, it, it's that dream that everyone has. So with that, though, if anyone wants to find out more information about Founders Live, what's the best or yourself, what's the best way to go about doing it? Yeah, you can go to founderslive.com. You know, that's our global community. And that's kind of where at least you can be pointed in the direction of everything and you can find us there. And then obviously like, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all, you know, we're there and, and you can find me uh, on any of those platforms and you can reach out to me as well and, and all that. Fantastic. We're going to have those links in the show notes. Uh, Nick, are you okay? Should I put your LinkedIn or your Twitter? What's the best social media post to put in the show notes? Yeah, well, you can throw on LinkedIn. It's it's fine. I'm definitely open to connecting. I will I will say this, everyone, and I know that your listeners are probably fine with it, but just a little tip here is like when when you reach out on LinkedIn, it's like it's it's nice to get a friendly connection and not led with some blanket pitch. You're all gonna like connect with me, like say hi and be a human and, and be like a good internet citizen. The pitches can come later, but a blanket pitch. I don't even respond to you now. I just don't. You know, it's like, sorry, I, I am too busy. And if and if that was a copy pasted pitch, then it's not going to be meaningful. Yeah, I like that four paragraph intro after you accept the, you know, the accept the invite. Just, and at the very bottom, are you interested in my investing or know anyone you can introduce me to? And then the pitch deck, and you're like, wait, I just I just met you and I oh like, man. No, it's sorry, all sorry, y'all. It ain't working. So just, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, Nick, this has been an amazing interview. Uh, I got a lot of great information out of this. Nick, thank you again for your time today on the Silicon Valley podcast. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Silicon Valley podcast. To access our resources, visit us at the Silicon Valley podcast.com and follow our host on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Sean Flynn SV. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional.